You're watching a one question special, the Permian to Putin, the oil industry reacts live from the Anmore family studio at Basin PBS with support from Diamondback Energy sponsored by Permian Basin Area Foundation. Tomorrow marks a month since Russia invaded Ukraine. Within a week, major Western oil companies, Exxon, British Petroleum and Shell among them, pulled their operations from Russia. A few days later, the United States, Canada, and Australia banned imports of Russian oil and natural gas. European countries more dependent on Russian oil have announced plans to cut the cord to Russia, though it is not known how long that will take. The effects of Russia's invasion ripple across the oil-rich Permian Basin. The eyes of the nation and the world focus on West Texas as a major source of oil and gas. What does the war mean for us, for the future of the oil and gas industry, for our national security? Tonight, we ask these questions of West Texas oil executives. I'm Becky Ferguson, coming to you live from Basin PBS Onmore Family Studio with a special edition of One Question, The Permian and Putin. If you, our viewers, have questions for our panel, please visit our Facebook page, and we'll do everything we can to get them answered for you. Tonight's event is made possible by our generous sponsor, the Permian Basin Area Foundation, with support from Diamondback Energy. So let's get started by introducing our panel. Ben Shepard is president of the Permian Basin Petroleum Association, an organization of more than 1,000 member companies advocating the interests of the oil and gas industry. Danny Wesson is Chief Operating Officer for Diamondback Energy, an independent publicly traded oil and gas company headquartered in Midland. Tommy Taylor is Director of Oil and Gas Development at Faskin Oil and Ranch, a privately owned more than 100-year-old Midland-based company engaged in oil, gas, ranching, and real estate throughout Texas and California. And Javid Anwar is founder, owner, and president of Midland Energy and Petroplex Energy, privately owned Midland-based oil and gas exploration companies founded in the 1980s. So let's get started. Thank you, gentlemen, so much for coming this evening. Uh, at a recent energy conference in Houston, both John Kerry, the special envoy for climate, and Jennifer Granholm, the secretary of energy, addressed energy leaders. John Kerry said that natural gas will play a key role in the transition to clean energy, adding that the Biden administration is pursuing an all-of-the-above approach. Senator Granholm said, we need oil and gas production to meet the current demand. I'm here to extend a hand of partnership because we'll only be able to meet these challenges of oil and gas supply and climate change by working together. She added, for over 100 years, the oil and gas industry has powered our nation and gotten us where we are today. We are eternally grateful. And we want you to power this country for the next 100 years with zero carbon technologies. Do these remarks signal the oil and gas in, to the oil and gas industry a paradigm shift in the administration toward the oil and gas industry? Ben, will you take this one? Thank you, Becky, and, and thank you, PBS, for, for having this discussion today. These are incredibly important issues to everybody. Uh, first of all, I'd just like to say that our thoughts and our prayers are with the people of Ukraine right now and the uh, terrible uh, invasion that they're facing, and uh, also with the president who's on his way to Europe to try to broker some peace. Um, and these, these words that you mentioned that we've heard in the last couple of days from, and, and over last week from the administration, they're very encouraging, very, very encouraging indeed. I think, I think they're correct uh, that we do need an all of the above strategy. I, I would say we're, we're optimistic that, that there'll be some significant follow through. But if we take a step back and, and just look at where have we gone or where has this administration been uh, since the beginning, uh, even beyond uh, January inauguration, but in the campaign, but you know, first day of uh, the president's administration in, in 21, uh, he canceled Keystone Pipeline. Uh, within the next couple of weeks, he canceled federal leasing and federal leases. Uh, there have been permit delays, there have been mu a multitude of new regulations, not to mention the kind of messaging that would indicate that oil and gas is, is not the preferred energy source moving forward and, and not necessary to be part of the transition um, as, as we move forward here and abroad. 
Um, so we're, we're looking for some actions to match those words. Uh, just yesterday, uh, the Securities and Exchange Commission issued a new rule requiring uh, all publicly traded companies to, to, couch, to attempt to calculate their future greenhouse gas, uh, I'm sorry, their, their climate impacts uh, and calculate their greenhouse gas uh, uh, emissions in, in tier one, which is how much they would produce, tier two, which is how much is produced by the sources they use for energy on a daily basis. And then even tier three, if you can think of that as basically automobiles or, or end users of the product and, and just figuring out how to calculate some of those numbers. Uh, it seems a little bit daunting right now and, and not necessarily a, a policy that would promote um, ramping up oil and gas. In fact, you're, you're pu putting uh, uh, you know, a, a business financial oversight group uh, in, in a policy uh, viewing and, and analyzing uh, position where it should typically be done by other regulatory agencies and in fact Congress. Do any of you other gentlemen want to add to that? I think I just echo, uh, you know, Ben's comments and, and Becky, thank you for having us here and, and look forward to the conversations. But, you know, we, we, we just, we're not asking for, you know, a whole lot of, 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 you know, tangible help. We really just, as an industry, need, need a show of support so that we can attract, you know, momentum and investors behind the space and attract capital so that we can, you know, to do the things we're really good at, which is deliver clean, reliable energy to, to the marketplace. I certainly wouldn't call it a paradigm shift. Maybe they moved a little bit in realizing that, hey, we do need an all of the above energy pl plan, which includes oil and gas, includes nuclear, includes, uh, you know, clean burning coal uh, to fire electricity plants and solar and wind and, you know, hydroelectric. We need everything. But, you know, what, what took me back a step from the statement is, yes, they see that we need oil and gas now that we're in a situation where, you know, we'll be firing up the, could be firing up a war machine if, if Putin doesn't stop at Ukraine. And, uh, but, but they go on to say, yes, this is going to be, uh, please provide us with zero carbon technology. Oil and gas are hydrocarbons. And yeah, maybe there's a technology in the future that we can sequester CO2, but we're, we're and, and there's companies doing that, but we're not there today. today yeah. But if we're gonna have, you know, we don't have a energy policy in this country. And if we're gonna have a secure country, we, we need some surety from our government in, in our regulations and, and how we treat the industries uh, and treat them equally across the board. The market will sort out the, the ones that aren't, that aren't affordable. But, you know, it's a terrible situation that we're setting here and people are paying 5 and $6 a gallon for gasoline. And, and we have this, you know, that produces this inflation surge across, you know, the whole spectrum. But uh, hof hopefully they'll keep seeing and, and keep moving and, and, you know, as an oil and gas producer, we want to be good stewards of the resources that we have of course, yeah. and do it right. And, we're, you know, we're always looking for technology to, to produce oil and gas in, in a cleaner way and uh, in, in ways that, that help society. Uh, but, but we need some surety from our leaders. Our leaders. Javid, did you have something you wanted to yeah, say? Yeah, i just like to say... Biden administration has to understand uh, law and supply, uh, demand and supply determine the prices. No matter what they do, you know, we can switch to hydrocarbon free energy. Can the industry absorb that cost or not? You know, it takes long time to make a transition. We cannot do it in a few years, go completely free of hydrocarbons. Hydrocarbon is a necessary part of this economy, necessary part of the energy that one requires. And the way they last six or eight months, they're treating the 
ordinary, like a stepchild. You know, they feel like they can replace it tomorrow, but that's not the not fact. Danny, I want to come back to you. Uh, the day before the Russian invasion of Ukraine, the price of West Texas Intermediate crude was just over $90. Uh, this evening, it closed at $114.40, so I think over 22% increase. And then closer to the pocketbooks of most folks, uh, gasoline prices have increased by about that same uh, percentage in recent weeks. And so can you help we laymen understand how a war halfway across the world results in these higher prices? Yeah, sure. I mean, you know, the oil is traded as a global commodity. It's a global price. Uh, it's not traded in, in, inside the, the walls of a country. So any, any supply disruption in the world Im impacts the price of oil. And gasoline is traded also as a separate commodity while the majority of the, of the price of a barrel or gallon of gasoline is, is founded in the barrel of oil, it, there's, a, there's a lagging effect there, but there's also, you know, a manufactured product. And so, you know, not only did the, the conflict uh, in, in Ukraine, the war in Ukraine, cause some supply disruptions to, to oil, which has increased that price, it also caused some, some supply disruptions to gasoline, which is manufactured as well in Russia. And so you have a little bit of a double whammy with the price of crude oil going up from the supply disruption, as well as you know, a, a shorting supply of, of gasoline being traded in the global stage. And then in, in compounding that is other additives that go into gasoline, corn, is, is, is used to make ethanol, which is blended in gasoline. Those things also cost more because a, a, a gallon of diesel costs more. And so it, it's just a, a kind of an exponential effect when you see these supply disruptions that, that, that you know, raise the price of, of a barrel of, of oil. So when somebody suggests that um, prices should be lower in the U.S., that's a non-starter. Yeah, I mean, really, it's 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 a globally traded commodity. So it, you know, whoever whoever can buy that gallon of gasoline for you know the most money, that's where that that gallon goes. And, uh, if I may, please do. I, I think prices are lower in the U.S. I mean, Europe is facing has been facing a natural gas crisis uh, since uh, the late fall, uh, and their prices have quadrupled, um, and so there are. You know, global effects, and, and we are very fortunate here. I mean, it varies from state to state. It varies within the state uh, for many of those same factors. Um, just, just a little bit more about the supply and demand. Yeah. Um, one of the challenges we're facing that's causing the, the run-up in prices is we'll, we all went through uh, two years of total demand destruction through COVID. Um, everything stopped. Demand, nobody was driving. No planes were flying. Um, manufacturing uh, slowed down dramatically and people quit producing. Uh, you know, remember, uh, there was a brief period in time where oil went negative. And minus $30. Well, it was minus $30 somewhere in that neighborhood. I mean, I, I, no one came to our aid at that point. Um, we certainly weren't trying to, we didn't have our hand on the lever at that point, hoping that we uh, had to pay people to take our oil or our gas. Um, on uh, 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 Inauguration day last uh, year, oil was $52 when when the president took office. Uh, in uh, January of this year, it was 82. So uh, there's been increasing inflation due to the, the 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 coming out of the COVID and the demand ramping up rapidly, faster than than supply can keep up, uh, and that's really having an impact. The war has just put an exclamation point on that. Well, let's talk a little bit about demand. Do you worry that high prices are going to destroy demand? Um, Bloomberg reported that BP predicted in 2019 that 2019 would be peak demand for oil. Uh, what are you seeing now and in, into the short and long-term future? And will third world demand offset shifts toward electrical vehicles, et cetera? Do you want to take a stab at that, Tommy? Well, I, I, yeah, I'll just say that, you know, like Ben was talking about during the pandemic uh, when people quit going to the office and quit driving. We did have what I would call true demand destruction. But I think uh, 
the market got surprised by the appetite that people had, you know, as the pandemic went on and people wanted to get out and travel and move about. Uh, I think, I think it shocked everybody that, that, uh, you know, it could come back as quick as it did. Certainly high prices is going to uh, reduce demand, but I wouldn't, I wouldn't say demand destruction. I don't think I've ever seen uh, a drop in the demand like we had in my career during the pandemic. But still, even then, the world was using, you know, 80 million barrels of oil a day, and today we're using probably around 100 million barrels a day. That's a, that's a lot of energy that, that the world needs to operate on. And uh, so, and you know, there's a lot of other countries that, that don't, aren't as fortunate as we are. It, they want the lifestyle we have, mm -hmm. and they're gonna get it. And so, you know, I think that's, that's just another point in saying that we need all these energy uh, resources at our disposal. And, you know, I, that's, that's, to have a very diverse energy system is, is secure for us, right? Because things happen uh, you know, hurricanes happen and refineries get shut down and it's, it's good to have diversity in the system. You know, Javin, a minute ago we were talking about uh, the administration and um, I'm wondering if, and Ben, you can address this too, has anyone in the administration called any of you all or contacted the industry about uh, ramping up drilling? And if they have, can you do it and over what period of time? Nobody from the administration ever called us to ramp up drilling. Um, I think so. Uh, it's unfortunate there is not enough energy expert on oil and gas that is work for Biden administration. The people I talked to a little bit, they are completely naive about oil and gas like you were. In that, they say, uh, most of the third world country would go to gas. So, uh, I mean, electricity. Electricity is mostly produced by natural gas, coal or whatever. So, yeah, you can call it electricity, but where the electricity come from? It's from natural gas. You know, I mean, so they are really naive about it. Yes, electricity is clean, but to generate electricity, you're burning gas. So, you know. It's, it's just amazing if they think electricity is clean, yes, but where are you getting the source? Hey, Danny, oh, Tommy, you wanted to add something. I was just gonna add that on, on to increase drilling. Today we're running in the United States about 650 drilling rigs. About half of those are in the Permian Basin. In 2014, you know, when the prices were, in, in this range that, that we're, we're sitting in today. We had 2,000 rigs running. Wow. So to say we could add 1,300 rigs today, it cannot be done. It can't be done overnight because we're still suffering from supply chain issues from the pandemic. Uh, you know, you'd have to put out those rigs, you're gonna have to find people, you're gonna have to source water, you're gonna have to source power you're going to have to get frack spreads to come out. We, we don't have that kind of equipment because during the pandemic, all that industry was decimated. Uh, you know, negative oil prices really, really uh, are going to have an impact going forward. Can we put out more rigs today? Yes, but, but not, not quickly and, and not enough to, you know, increase the production in the United States to offset what Russia was was sending to us, even though you know it's six or seven percent of our supply, uh, it, it will take time to do that. Danny, did you want to add something? Well, I'm, I mean, I think there's, there's some a bunch of points being made here. You know, I think the you know the supply chain issues are real. Um, they're not just related to to you know you getting a package to your doorstep that you order online. We, we have real shortages of steel, of steel manufacturing, of, uh, of labor, of, of, of drivers to, to move equipment around. And, and it's unlike anything we've seen in the last decade in this space. We've dealt with shortages, whether it be steel or labor or, or whatever, whatever it may be, 
throughout this last decade through the cycles, but we've never had them all compound at once, and we're seeing that today. And so, you know, we, can we ramp up? Absolutely, we can. Um, it's just not going to happen overnight. There's a lot, of, a lot of dominoes that have to fall to get the supply chain issues worked out, and we need help, you know, really need help from the administration to, to help, you know, figure out what's the bottlenecks of these supply chains, because they, they exist. We, we have the manufacturing capacity to do these things, but for some reason it's not, it's not coming, you know, to the table. Along, along the lines of uh, tubular goods and steel products, uh, a significant source of, of the oil industry's casing comes out of Ukraine and Russia. Wow. And, and even some, some of the, the pipe that we buy uh, from a plant in Ukraine, the plant's been bombed off the face of the earth. And so we're going we're gonna to see these, these kind of problems. Yes, they're... they're mm -hmm. And I agree with Danny, you know, we've, we've had one or two of these things to deal with over time, but we have a bunch of them. This is a perfect out. storm at an inopportune time. It's, yeah, yeah. Uh, the Europeans have announced intentions to cut the cord to Russia, though it isn't known how long that's going to take. Uh, Germany has announced plans to build plants to process um, liquefied natural, U.S. liquefied natural gas. Um, and in the meantime, does that mean more reliance on coal? In particularly in Europe, and what are the implications of uh, these moves for the U.S. oil and gas industry? Ben, do you mind talking about that? I'm happy to take that one. I, I, I don't know all that much about coal. I, I do think uh, w what we're seeing is that we expect that it will increase the dependency on liquefied natural gas, hopefully uh, increasingly from the United States, increasingly from the Permian Basin. Um, we're also seeing in Europe that some of the uh, plans to uh, mothball nuclear uh, power plants are being delayed be because uh, they've got to get their electricity from somewhere and it's uncertain where those supplies will come from. The feedstocks are, are important uh, and, and natural gas is going to continue to play an increasing role in, in that effort. Danny, you've talked about, do you think that some folks are going to increase the use of coal during this period when there's a shortage. Would you talk a little bit more about that? Yeah, coal, coal's just, it's cheap and accessible. I mean, you look at what, you know, just, just look at China, they, they've, as they've grown their energy consumption, it's been really met with coal and, and because it's, it's easy and cheap to, to, to procure and it's cheap to put in the, the power generation. I think Europe, you, what you're going to see is, is, is a shift towards more natural gas as a baseload energy. Natural gas is a fantastic, you know, uh, resource for power generation. It, it is reliable, it's steady, it's cheap, it's very clean, and just so happens that the U.S. has a tremendous resource of natural gas that we can supply in a very sustainable way to, to global markets, not just our own market, and it can help, you know, strengthen up and, and, and be, you know, sustainable and, and secure delivery of that product to our, to our trading partners across the pond. So I think, I think that seems to be the way they're leaning, and I, I don't know what's going to happen in the short term. You may see some more coal generation just to meet the, the needs, but I think long term, U.S. natural gas and U.S. LNG is, is, a, is a tremendous solution. And LNG means? Liquefy natural gas. They liquefy it to put it on a boat and ship it across right. the world. Okay, good. Um, according to energy expert David Jurgen, in 2008, the U.S. imported 60% of its oil. Today, we are energy independent on paper, a net zero importer, but we still import oil. So are we energy independent? And does our current status protect our national security? Ben, are we energy independent? I think we are closer to it uh, in recent years we're closer to it than we've ever been i think one of the complicated things about the hydrocarbon industry and is that not all oil is alike uh, and some of these engineers here can can give us a quick and down and dirty lesson on some of that but suffice it to say you, you've got all kinds of grades of oil we produce west texas intermediate it's it's a lighter clearer sweeter kind of crude that has certain uses. For, for other kinds of gasoline and gasoline blends, you need a thicker, heavier crude. 
that is produced elsewhere. Sometimes that's in other parts of the country. Sometimes that's in places like Venezuela and, and overseas. So um, I think we can, we can, we have energy independence in our grasps, no doubt about it. If we can be allowed to drill. Yeah, I think a good way of putting it, and, and I think the uh, EIA, the Energy Information Administration, puts out these numbers, but I think the way you put it is we're net energy neutral. Okay. In other words, if you take all the energy that we use on a daily basis in the U.S., and then you take all our sources, uh, oil and gas, <clears throat> coal, nuclear, you know, green energy, and, and everything we export and import, we're very, very neutral. In other words, we're, we make and bring in and send out about what we use. That is a very, very powerful place to be. I can remember as a 13-year-old boy, you know, in the 70s, the, the first energy crisis, and thinking, oh, my gosh, and, and learning from my parents how much oil we import and how reliant we were on the Middle East. And how fortunate for, for the United States and our allies that we are able to send out LNG today. Because 15 years ago, that, or, or maybe 18 years ago, that wasn't even a thought. We were thinking about having to bring in LNG from other places. But, but we can meet our own needs and our partners in Europe. That is a tremendous thing to be able to do. Tremendous progress. Javid, did you want to add something? Yeah. Um, I say, w while in the Trump administration, we were becoming uh, energy independent uh, with Biden administration, it, it, it was a setback because they don't want to welcome hydrocarbon. But you can see, like Tommy said, in the 70s, you know, we were so much dependent on Middle East oil and Right now, we are, Permian Basin has come long ways and would have been if Trump would have been in office, maybe more energy independent than ever. But, you know, the oil companies see that administrations, major oil companies, don't want to put big money where administration is dis discouraging them. So the future... You know, you want to put billions and millions of dollars where you, you know down the line you can make money with that stuff. With Biden administration, you get wrong signals. Well, we've often talked about uh, being uh, secure nationally because of, with oil and gas, and do you feel like we're in that position right now? I think we're, much, uh, we're in a much uh, more secure position than we've ever been before. Uh, frankly, uh, I, I do. I do think that uh, there's some discouraging signs out there, discouraging investment right now. Um, I, hopefully, those those attitudes are, are are going to modify somewhat now that we see the necessity. Uh, back to the pricing. I mean, we're all living with these high prices and the high inflation. It's not good for anybody. Uh, you, you know, from oil and gas and having to purchase the the different steps of the process to the parents trying to go out and buy food. I mean, gasoline in your tank, you name it. It impacts all of us. Uh, and we, we need to be able to produce more. Uh, and the per we're fortunate here in the Permian Basin in that we have the best rock of any place in the world. Uh, we have some of the smartest people uh, and some of the best infrastructure. And, and we, we need to unleash that. Uh, we also produce the cleanest barrels, what people forget. In, in these di di discussions about other countries or, or we're asking some other country to, to uh, increase supply uh, in the Middle East so that that'll help balance things out. We have the strictest environmental regulations of any country on earth. And so every barrel that's produced here in America is cleaner than barrels produced anywhere else. And so it is a win-win. I mean, we can still keep our eye on cleaning the environment and, 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 and cleaning up the environment and, and making sure that we're reducing emissions and all of those things uh, remain important. We can do that while we're increasing production. We're gonna take a quick break and come back uh, just in a few minutes and have some more discussion about this. I bring to you our own Molly Ivan. 
tussle with the tale of media firebrand Molly Ivins, six feet of Texas trouble who took on the good old boy corruption wherever she found it. Her razor sharp wit left both sides of the aisle laughing and craving ink in her columns. One night only on this Texas PBS station. Damn, it's good to be back home again. Raise hell, the life and times of Molly Ivins. Hi, I'm Emily, your Basin PBS Membership Director. You might recognize my name from some of the letters you receive from Basin PBS. Or if you've called the station, you've probably talked to me. Sure, you watch our programs and come to our events, but what actually happens if you don't support Basin PBS? What's the worst that could happen? Sure, things might change a little. There might be some cuts here and there. We'd probably have to get rid of some of the kids' programming and dramas, some of the news programs and live events, and probably a lot of the arts and culture programming you can't see anywhere else. But what does it really matter if you don't support base and PBS? You'll hardly know the difference. The nation's leading experts in pediatric health recently declared a national emergency in adolescent mental health. Teen years have always been challenging, now more than ever. What's happening with our West Texas teens and what can we do to help? Tune in for this Basin PBS Live Town Hall when we talk to local experts Thursday, March 31st at 7 p.m. here on Basin PBS, underwritten by the Springboard Center. Welcome back to tonight's special edition of One Question, The Permian and Putin coming to you live from the Anwar family studio here at Basin PBS. When we left, left off, we were talking about um, national security as it relates to oil and gas. And Javid, you wanted to talk a little bit about that. You know, what I have heard from very famous geologists and experts, we have more oil if we, if we are allowed to drill we can produce more oil than Saudi Arabia and Russia. We could be number one producer in this part of the world. Given the time and the facilities to let us operate and bring oil from the ground, we can provide more oil than Russia and Saudi Arabia, which, you know, I, I think so Saudi Arabia can produce over 10 or 11 million barrels a day easily. So can Russia. We can beat that number too, based on new technology. Yeah. Tommy, you had something you wanted to add. Uh, what, you know, the Permian, <laughs> if you go back to 2007, we were making a million barrels of oil a day. Today we're making over five million barrels a day. And that's after this very tough pandemic. I mean, without the pandemic, we, we, we might be up at six or seven million barrels a day. So I, I really agree with Javid. We, we have that capability, you know, if we're given the, the opportunity to do that. But, and, 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 you know, we've talked many times about the, the storage of high-level nuclear waste in the Permian, and that's one of my uh, passions that I talk about often. But I think, I think this, as terrible as it is, but it, it, it allows us to see you know, when Russia went into Ukraine, what's the first thing they did? They took over Chernobyl. Mm. They bombed a nuclear waste site. They took over the biggest uh, nuclear power plant in the world and had, had the outskirts of it on fire. And so, you know, we do have this great resource here, this multi-layered, we call them pancakes, of uh, sedimentary rocks that are full of oil, and, and we just need to get at them, but to, to site, all of the nation's high-level uh, uh, nuclear waste in the middle of the Permian Basin, it's, it's economic malfeasance. You wouldn't, you wouldn't put that risk here because, you know, if somebody wanted to do something bad to us, and, and you know, the bad people, the terrorists, they're all about disruption. And, man, that, that would, we're just that would setting a, it up for them to do something easy. So. I just wanted to make that point that that's Absolutely. very, very important. That is an important point. With respect to those, those production numbers, Tommy's exactly right. But what, what gets overlooked, that those are actually, as I understand it, those are record production numbers. So we 
have been in the last several months continue as we've come through the pandemic we're now hitting record production numbers and it continues to grow ever so slightly um, each month and um, you know these are positive signs and we get I think unfairly criticized for well that brings me to our next question being unfairly criticized okay uh, since 2015, over 600 energy companies have filed for bankruptcy, representing tens of thousands of jobs and hundreds of billions of dollars in assets. A decade ago, energy companies represented 15% of the Standard & Poor's 500. At one point in 2020, they represented less than 2% of the S&P. Though it is clear that higher prices come as a relief to the industry, even though we would never wish them under these particular horrible circumstances. Uh, in recent weeks, some have accused the industry of price gouging and massive profits. Uh, can you respond to those charges, Ben? Well, as I was just uh, alluding to, I think we, uh, well, to the first part of your question, I think there's no question that in the last decade, uh, particularly, there's been some fits and starts, but we've been in consolidation mode and there's been uh, multiple mergers and acquisitions and and um, you've seen uh, the major oil companies come back to the basin um, because, you know, as Tommy says, we have the best geology uh, and, and some of the best workforce you can find. So the um, independents are finding it a little more difficult. These horizontal wells that we're drilling are much more expensive um, and, and the completion technologies are, are quite expensive. And so it's, some of them are being squeezed out of the market a little bit. I think there's no question. But interestingly, uh, two, the two, lar two companies right now in the Permian that have the largest number of rigs running are privately held companies. They're not publicly traded. So, so there's, there's a lot of shaking out that's going on in the industry, and it's just sort of part of a, uh, a, a bit of a natural, um, a natural uh, process. Danny, do you mind addressing the charge of price gouging? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, we talked about it earlier. We, the oil and gas market is a global market. We, we are price takers. We don't, we don't set the price. In 2020, when price went negative, if we, if we could control the price, we wouldn't have allowed it to go negative. Right. It's, mm -hmm. You know, I think that's, it's, it's an easy thing to say if, if you're trying to point the finger, but the reality is it's a very complicated industry with very complicated uh, supply and demand economics, and and we we just have to take the price that's that's set on the market, and we try to model our company off of some mid-cycle oil price, which is is below the price we're trading at today. And and look, you know, when 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 prices come up, activity increases, and you you're seeing activity increase. I mean, the rig counts up tremendously over the past six months. Um, you know, 200 rigs in the, added in the last last six to nine months. You're seeing investment creep into the space and, and, and you know, we've talked about the supply chain limitations. Right. They're real and, and I think if, if, they, if we had some clarity on when those things could be addressed, I think you'd see activity ramp up even, even quicker. You hear many stories today about people who want to add activity, who want to deploy capital, but just simply can't. And, and so, you know, I think we've got to address the, the real issues in the room, which are how do we get people back to work? How do we get our manufacturing facilities up and running and start delivering barrels to the market on top of the million barrels we're already going to add to U.S. supply this year alone? We have a question from an audience member that addresses some topics that you all brought up a little bit ago. She's asking, what are the specific ways the current administration can provide support to our industry to enable us to furnish oil and natural gas to our allies in Europe? Who wants to take that? I'll take, I'll start and maybe Ben has some, some good points here, but I really think it's just as simple as, as, you know, as having an honest discussion about oil and gas or hydrocarbons role in our energy policy. And supporting hydrocarbon development, responsible hydrocarbon development in the United States. Things, you know, bring back the Keystone Pipeline. Don't cancel offshore leasing. Show that the, the, the federal government is not going to impede development of oil and gas. It's going to make sure it's done responsibly, but it's going to support development of oil and gas. And that way it doesn't, it doesn't impede from bringing investment into the space. 
We need, we need sound regulation, and, and none of our companies are against good regulations. We don't need regulations designed to put us out of business, and we don't need the rhetoric coming out of the federal government saying, you know, we're going to keep it in the ground. We need regulatory certainty. All businesses need that. We need tax certainty, and, 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 and the market will, you know, when we have high oil prices, we'll drill more wells, right? And, and hopefully that'll give us more supply, and it's a balancing act. Did you want to add something, Javid? Yeah, it's very important that, you know, the government part give a signal that they are not going to interfere in oil prices someday. You remember what Jimmy Carter did back in 78. He, he called it old oil, new oil, and then old oil was selling for a lot less than new oil can be drilled for. So we don't want all these regulations. Let the market determine what we have to pay for the oil and gas and hydrocarbons, you know. That's the way, let it freely operate. And that's a wrong statement that oil companies are gouging. We cannot gouge very long. If somebody's selling their oil cheap, go buy it. So, I mean, this is just uh, to make public happy, political people make a statement, those oil companies are gouging you. You know, it's, it's not, it's free market. Anybody can buy oil from somewhere else. And we should be the world leader in producing oil because we can provide certainty and stability in the oil market uh, because unlike uh, Russia or Iran or somebody else, we should be leader in producing oil. We have the capacity. Let the, let the Permian Basin drill its capacity, see how many more billions of barrels of oil we can add. You mentioned a minute ago uh, cheaper oil. Um, today, I think a barrel of Russian oil is priced at $85. Uh, some people have suggested that our Western boycotts of Russian energy will have little to no effect, that the Russians will sell their products to other countries like China or India. What are y'all's thoughts on that? I'll start off. I think um, it's going to hurt them. I think there's going to be China and India are going to buy that oil. They're going to see it as a good deal. But not just the oil, but, you know, we're boycotting everything out of Russia. And, and like the steel mills, that's going to hurt. People are going to have to make sacrifices. I mean, it, it's, it's going gonna, it's gonna to hit all areas of the market. And uh, so, you know, when, when we do this, people need to realize that, yeah, we really are going to be making sacrifices. Well, I have to say something. What happening in Ukraine is inhumane. People, children are dying. I don't think so. I like to support any kind of Russian industry that a country's leader or whatever goes in and slaughter people and kill innocent people, they have not done anything wrong. So Russia needs to learn a lesson that the whole world cannot tolerate this. Even we may have to suffer in some areas of oil and gas or some other areas. But if we let everybody do it, tomorrow China can invade Taiwan, Hong Kong, you know. Well, you all seem to be suggesting sort of a wartime mentality that citizens need to um, be willing to make some sacrifices in the coming weeks and months. Would that be an accurate way of summing up what you're saying? So up to a certain extent, yes. You know, oil prices, other things will be disturbed. But would you let Russia do whatever you want and become hostage uh, every time Russia does anything? Oh, we better not say anything because the oil prices or other commodity casing prices will go up. Yeah, it will go up, I understand that. But we, Russia has to understand, and China, they cannot do anything in this 20th century, you know, invade a country which has done nothing wrong because they think they are planning to do. I mean, that's ridiculous. Danny, you look like you wanted to add something. Well, yeah, I was just going to say, I think, you know, if you look at kind of our, our kind of, the way we've, 
the world has changed over you know the past few decades. We, we've become a global, you know, trade world, and and we ever we trade things with everyone. And and the way we've structured our foreign policy is, look, instead of going and 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 attacking somebody with guns, we're going to attack someone who misbehaves with, with sanctions and and that means that there's economic downfall because of those san sanctions and and one of those dominoes is that we're not going to be able to buy things for as cheap because now we have to there's less supply of something that that country was making and so the price for that good goes up and that that's the reality of the world we live in today and so i think yes if 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 we're in a wartime situation and we're going to use the economy to, to put pressure on the bad behaviors, we have to be willing as citizens of this country to take on, you know, that burden and, and do it for, you know, for the people who are truly suffering. And, and it, it might cost us a little bit more money at the pump or at the grocery store in this, in this short cycle period of time, but at least we're not having to go through what, what you know, these millions of people in, in Ukraine are having to go well through. Well said. Well said. Any, any time people can conserve energy is good for all of us. Well, we're going to talk a little bit about conservation now. Uh, most of the conversation related to energy of light has been focused on meeting the immediate needs through oil and gas. But a part of the conversation has also been on moving toward renewables and carbon neutral energy. What is the oil and gas industry doing to be a part of the carbon neutral conversation? Ben, do you want to take that one? Well, I think um, every, every company right now, for a variety of reasons, uh, is analyzing ways that they can do things more efficiently. Um, the, the pressures, whether they be investor pressures, political pressures, um, shareholder pressures, or just internal pressures, everybody is looking to, to identify ways that create our product, produce our product in a cleaner way, a more sustainable way. And the investment dollars that are going into to, uh, to cleaner processes and technologies are just in the billions of dollars right now. And I think that is a new trend over the last five to seven years uh, that you're seeing. And I think particularly the publicly traded companies have to report very regularly to their shareholders what they're doing and they have to measure it. Um, I think we all that love oil and gas, we, we know that there's enough oil and gas in the ground, Javid, for, for decades to come. And I think it's all of our vision that we would like, uh, we would like people to enjoy oil and gas and recognize the wonderful benefits from, from the process, uh, from the equipment that's made, from medical uh, devices to the transportation fuels we're talking about. It runs the gamut. You really can't find anything that doesn't have an oil and gas component. And we, but yet we've been vilified repeatedly by one group or another that oil and gas is bad, we're killing the planet, we've got to keep it in the ground now. So I think our reputation as an industry has suffered and consequently the, the industry has responded with billions of dollars of investment, in, you know, uh, cutting back on emissions, cutting back on flaring, uh, reuse and recycle water. Uh, we, we're, part, we're very much in that conversation. Yeah, I mean, you know, just diamond back, you know, we, we a couple years ago sat around the table with the leaders of the company and we looked at it and said, look, we can do this better and we should do this better. And we set long-term targets, five-year targets to reduce our greenhouse gas emissions by 50% and reduce our methane emissions by 70%. And we're well on track to to meet those or exceed those emissions and maybe even do so early you know I think you know all of our public peers for the most part have set those same types of targets and you know some form or another and and committed to net zero operations through at some point in time and and the industry is taking not just words but they're putting you know they're they're putting action behind it and and doing the right things and I don't see industry and other parts of the world doing the things that the US EMP industry is doing here here in the United States to, to significantly lower our carbon footprint and our methane footprint uh, within our operations. It, it's, it's really remarkable. I mean, just in the Permian, you look at what's going on from methane monitoring, uh, you know, people, 
sensors out on, on in the fields that alert you know the operator to a, to a methane leak instantly whereas in in the past that may, leak may have gone on for for months maybe even you know a year before somebody would have found it so we're really stepping up our game as an industry and i, I think i think you know we're trying to get that news out out there that you know the USEMP industry is really really getting after it well and a related question tommy i'm going to ask you this and then you can add whatever else okay. it was that you were just about to say uh, this is not exactly related to the Russian invasion, but it's sort of related to what Danny just was talking about. Um, there is something called ESG. Could you tell us what those letters stand for and what the implications are for the industry? They stand for environmental, social, and governance. Governance. I can't hardly say that word. <laughs> but it's, it's about um, companies being... Uh, like we've talked earlier, being good stewards of the resources we have, not wasting things, uh, being engaged in the communities, being engaged with uh, uh, our legislation, our legislators, and, and our governor, government, uh, to be sustainable, to be transparent, to be good community partners, uh, to, to show people how we're recycling water and, and doing, doing things in a, uh, you know, I, I tell a lot of the young people at our company, we're, we're not operating like uh, the previous generation. I mean, we're, it, it, it's, it's a lot different now. We're a lot cleaner than we were. We're also, I think people would be shocked at how much technology we use, particularly in the drilling operations. We're big, big users in technology, and we, we're a proven ground for a lot of uh, technological advances. So, and, and there's some of these bigger companies. Uh, I know Oxy has a big carbon sequestration project. Uh, there's talk about using waste stream heat capture technologies. Uh, so, and, and just look at the coal industry. I mean, they have some plant designs that are much more efficient and much cleaner than, than it was you know, two decades ago. But this ESG rating, as I understand it, uh, can be, it's something that all companies have to report, and it can be a stumbling block for getting capital for oil and gas. Is that correct, Dan? <coughs> yeah, so, I mean, you know, most public companies have to put out, you know, what we call a sustainability report, um, but but the, the large investor investment funds typically all look at, there's a few firms that, kind of give you a sustainability rating or an ESG score and and the large investment funds will take that score and kind of say okay if you if you're not at least here we can't we can't invest in your company and so you know there's it, it's there's a lot of momentum that's been pushed behind you know the ESG framework and, and investment strategy especially you know through covid and 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 people kind of looking at okay how do we how do we want to invest and you know, the, the things they're asking for are the right things. There's still a lot of, you know, things we got to figure out about how, how, do we, how do we truly rank somebody. I think there's some subjectivity to some of the scores today. But, you know, the industry is, is really responding. And, and the industry has always been tremendous social stewards. They've been extremely involved in the communities with which they operate and, and work and, and live. I mean, look at the com own community that we live in and how much good uh, oil and gas has done for, for even the studio we're sitting in today. But the E side is where we have to get better, and, and we have really made the commitment to do so, and, and I think we can see these ESG scores improving as an industry and attracting some of that investment back to the space. Last summer, the Texas legislature passed and the governor signed a bill that basically says if you boycott Texas energy, I guess through ESG ratings, Texas will boycott you. Can you explain that bill and tell us if you believe it helps or hurts investments in oil and gas, Ben? I think what you're referring to is uh, Senate Bill 13. Okay. And it did, in fact, pass and was signed by the governor. Essentially, it says that if you, uh, that the state of Texas, and you have to remember that we have billions of dollars that the state invests for, you know, teacher retirement system, uh, employee retirement system, billions of dollars that are invested in uh, all manner of, of funds. Uh, and if a certain investor group 
or bank or others uh, uh, disparage, urge boycott, or you know, various list of certain things, activities that they will um, they, they'll be put on a list. The Comptroller of Public Accounts is required to uh, put together a list of those institutions that that are. Uh, uh, creating havoc in the space and discouraging investment uh, in, in oil and gas. And they'll be sort of scored in such a way similar to the ESG score. Um, I, I think what it was the legislative response to, um, or an acknowledgement of how important oil and gas is to the state of Texas, because going back several years, there's certainly uh, a number of very high profile uh, investor groups that were highly critical of oil and gas discouraging, uh, limiting capital to, to companies, uh, doing all kinds of things, um, you know, getting in, involved in uh, uh, shareholder activism and trying to get their own people put on, uh, anti-oil and gas people put on boards. So it was a response to that kind of activity and the state has said, well, we're, we're you know, if you're gonna do that, then we're, we're not gonna um, invest in you. Is it too soon to tell if it's had any effect? Well, I can tell you uh, that uh, I have heard from some of the major, major banks uh, that are, have been making the rounds, um, basically saying that they no longer hold those views they held two years ago. And by golly, uh, we, we're still invested in oil and gas, and we love oil and gas, and uh, um, uh, we don't want to be on the list. Interesting. But I don't know. The list hasn't been created, and I, no action that I'm aware of has been taken yet. Um, you all have all mentioned that markets love stability. Uh, what would be a good market price? Uh, would you like the government to provide a floor? Tommy? No. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, two years ago, almost to the day, we were on a conference with the Railroad Commission, and a lot of people were asking the, the Railroad Commission to, to prorate production because we were, you know, in a negative price environment. And, and we, we weren't in favor of that. Anytime you have a government intervention into a market, it's not good. And, and on this side, I mean, uh, I, I wouldn't think I'd want them to intervene. I mean, the free market is, will, work, will work itself out on the su supply and demand. It always does. David? I remember back when Jimmy Carr was president, he put a uh, ceiling in the oil for 42 or 45 dollars. Same thing was going on till Reagan became president. He said, let the, let the free market determine. Oil price went to 25, below 25 to in teens, and the market work is out. You know, had Jimmy Carr would be in the president, we will be still buying oil at 42, which will be great for oil industry, but it's not good for consumers. So let the free market determine what oil prices we have to pay so that we can produce oil and gas at economical rate, not creating artificial ceilings. And on that note, we're going to have to go by. But thank you so much, gentlemen, for uh, being with us, Ben, Danny, Tommy, and Javid, for <coughs> shedding light on this complicated issue for giving our viewers a better understanding of the issues related to this historical invasion of Ukraine and its effect on our nation through the lens of the oil and gas industry. We are grateful to the Permian Basin Area Foundation for generously sponsoring tonight's program and to Diamondback Energy for their support. We also wanna thank our Basin PBS board and staff along with the Elizabeth Reed Yeager family and the Anwar family for their generous support of Basin PBS. Basin PBS could not bring your, this great quality programming without your valued viewer support. If you want to learn more about local programming or become a member of Basin PBS, please visit our website at basinpbs.org. I'm Becky Ferguson. Good night. Thank you guys so much.